Good evening and thank you for being here today. Jackson Power Pharmaceuticals Medical Services Department are happy to welcome you all to this AOGD Delhi PG Forum case discussion on antepartum hemorrhage by postgraduates of Deen Dayal Upadhyay Hospital, New Delhi. This is knowledge sharing initiative of Jackson Power Pharmaceuticals, makers of Divatron 10 mg tablet, fully indigenized micronized hydrogestron, the only brand having 36 months of shelf life. Jackson Paul would like to express gratitude and extend warm welcome to experts and attendees. Please use Q&A box or chat box to post your queries, suggestions, explanations. You can share the WhatsApp link posted on the chat box to help spread the word about this webinar. Now I'm requesting coordinator Delhi PG Forum, Dr. Sunita Malik, ma'am, and coordinator Delhi PG Forum, Dr. Shivani Agarwal to kindly initiate this webinar. Good evening and thank you, Dr. Amit. Uh, I welcome the Dindya Lopade Hospital uh, uh, people who are who is going to join for the first time uh, in our PG Forum. And they are going to discuss a very important case of APH, in, uh, which uh, we know that the, if it is available, it is going to be given in the exam for uh, all the, I mean, the, for the PGs. And in any case, they do get these uh, uh, cases of hemorrhage, which they are supposed to deal with, how to deal with them, how to diagnose, what is the likely investigations which are needed, and uh, what is the life-threatening hemorrhage, how to control that. So all these things are going to be discussed by Dr. Shashi and her PGs. And with her is Dr. Kamna Datta from RML Hospital, uh, who, is go, who are going to uh, uh, co-moderate the session. Uh, can we have Dr. Shashi uh, uh, is going to lead mainly. And, but Dr. Monica Suri, who was the chairperson of today's meeting, has not been able to um, attend because of some uh, uh, un, uh, this thing uh, have some health problem. Uh, so we have uh, now Dr. Kamna Datta, who's a professor in Ops and Gaini in ABVIMS and Dr. RML Hospital, New Delhi. She, her areas of interest are high-risk pregnancy, oncology, and uh, vaginal surgery. And she's got many publications in national and international journals. And Dr. Shashi Lata, uh, Kabra Maheshwari. She is a senior specialist in Dindya Lupadhyay Hospital. She is NB faculty, is a recipient of many awards and the member of many committees and chairperson. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. So thank over you. to you, Dr. Shashi, uh, to start today's uh, presentation. And the PGs who are going to participate are Dr. Payal and Dr. Smita. Yes, Dr. Payal and Smita, you can now start the, today's case. Thank you. Thank you so much, ma'am. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Sunita Malik, ma'am, Dr. Shivani Agarwal, Dr. Smita Rathor, ma'am, Dr. Dipti, for giving Dinda Lupada Hospital this opportunity. So when we talk about antipartum hemorrhage, it is defined as bleeding from or into the genital tract occurring from 24 weeks onwards prior to the birth of the baby as per Government of India guideline 2019. In few literatures, Western literatures, it's written as 22 weeks also. The incidence is two to 5% of all pregnancies and the primary causes are a brush of which occur in one in 100 pregnancies and placenta previa, one in 200 to 400 pregnancies. Unclassified causes are up to 35%. Placental abruption or abruptio placenta is defined as separation of the placenta, either partially or totally, from its implantation site before delivery. And in, from Latin, the letter translates as rending asunder of the placenta, which denotes a sudden accident, which is the characteristic in most of the cases. And in the purest sense, the term premature separation of the normally implanted placenta is most descriptive because it excludes separation of a placenta. Previa. Abruption likely begins with the rupture of a decidual artery, and initially there is hemorrhage in the decidual bacillus, and subsequently expanding retroplacental hematoma, which splits in the decidual and leaves a thin layer adhering to the myometrium. The decidual hematoma grows to lift away and compress the adjacent placenta, and it is uh, described as external hemorrhage and concealed hemorrhage. And the concealed hemorrhage is usually associated with conductive coagulopathy. And uh, there is 
increased pressure in the intermediate space, which is caused by the expanding greater placental clot and which forces placental thromboplast gain into the maternal circulation. And you should know that the source of blood in this hemorrhage is mainly maternal. And uh, placenta previa is described as the, the placenta, which is implanted somewhere, somewhere in the low uterine segment, either over or very near to the internal cervical loss. The incidence of previa is rising. So now I invite Dr. Payal to present her case. Good, uh, good evening to everyone. I'm Dr. Payal along with my colleagues. I'm presenting the case of uh, Mrs. XYZ, a 30 year old female, recipient of Harry Nagar, homemaker by occupation. She is studied to test standard. Her husband, uh, Mr. ABC, 28 year old male, laboral by occupation, education up to the 9th standard. And she belongs to upper lower socioeconomical status. First year of last menstrual period was 22nd June 2022, and expected date of delivery is 29 March 2023. She is 34 weeks on the day of examination. She is gravida to paraben living one. Came with a complete history of amenorrhea since eight months and complained of bleeding per vaginum since two to three hours. The patient was apparently all right two hours back. She stated that while doing her household activity in the morning, she suddenly noticed bleeding per vaginum that was bright red in color and had made her clothes soaked with blood. She had used two pads that was completely soaked in last two hours and continually bleeding since then, but the volume has decreased. Bleeding was not associated with abdominal pain and backache, and she was perceiving adequate fetal movement. No history of trauma, quite a lack, fall, heavy weight lifting, strain during defecation or jerking movement during travel. There is no history of pedal edema, headache, epigastric pain, blurring of vision. No history of palpitation, fatigue and breathlessness. No history of leaking per vagina and no history of any bleeding from orifices. She had a similar episode of a bleeding in her second trimester. She conceived spontaneously. The pregnancy was confirmed by urine pregnancy test at 45 days of amenorrhea, and she visited first time in our hospital at eight week of her pregnancy. Dating scan was done at eight week of pregnancy, which was correspond to gestational age, and NTNB scan done at 12 week of pregnancy, which was normal. And double marker was advised, but not done by patient, and all AAC profile are normal. First one. She was taking folic acid tablets. No history of bleeding, burning, maturation, fever with rash, excessive vomiting. No history of spotting or bleeding per vagina, abdominal pain. No history of exposure to radiation or drug intake. Quickening was felt at fifth month of gestation. Second AMC visit to hospital at 18 weeks of pregnancy. And uh, the second trimester level to ultrasound was done. And there was no gross congenital anomaly found. And it was shown that posterior low-lying placenta was there. The patient was communicated about the same and instructed abstinence, avoiding heavy weight lifting and traveling, and to report immediately if bleeding occurs. She had a history of vaginal bleeding in fourth month of pregnancy. It was sudden in onset and used a pad that was half soaked and stopped completely on its own without taking any medication. It was not associated with abdominal pain. She had no history of hospital admission for this age. She was taking regular iron and calcium tablets and two doses of a TD vaccine were taken in fourth and fifth month. Complete blood count, urine, no routine microscopy and 75 gram of OGTT were done, which was normal. There's no history of pedal edema, headache, epigastric pain or visual disturbance and BP was normal. No history of palpitation, breathlessness, weakness or easy funding ability. No history of excessive hunger, thirst, frequency of urination, recurrent skin or urine infection. No history of leaking per vaginal fever and burning maturation. She visited at 32 weeks of her pregnancy. Patient was perceiving adequate fetal movement. Iron calcium tablet was taken by the patient and no feature suggestive of hypertension, anemia or diabetes. There was no history of leaking per vaginal fever or burning maturation and weight gain during course of pregnancy was 10 kg. All parameters were found normal in the ultrasound, which we do, uh, did in 32 weeks of her pregnancy, and uh, fetal growth was normal. It was cephalic presentation. Retroplacental space was normal, and placenta was posterior low line. She had 
content may not get 12 years of age. Previous cycle was regular, 28 days, 4 to 5 days of flow, and she used 2 to 3 packs per day. No history of dysmenuria or passage of clot. First day of last menstrual period is 22nd June 2022. And expected date of delivery is 29 March 2023. She was sure of date and her married life is 8 year. It was non-consanguinous marriage. She spontaneously conceived and she is gravitated to Paravan living one. She delivered a male baby of 2.6 kg by LACS. It was full term baby at DDO hospital. Three years back in view of fetal distress. Induction of later done in view of post-datism. But due to fetal distress, patient underwent emergency LSAs in latent phase. There is no history of manual removal of placenta. Baby is alive, healthy, with no history of diabetes or gestational hypertension in this pregnancy, and no history of nursery stay. Intrapartum, postpartum stay uneventful. Self-retained catheter is out on day two, and no history of wound sepsis or resuturing. No history of blood transfusion or ICU stay. The patient was discharged on day three, and post placental copper T375 inserted at the time of section. And uh, now there is a death. This is a first present pregnancy. Past history, there is no history of diabetes mellitus, hypertension, epilepsy, asthma, thyroid disorder, TB, or chronic illness. No history of bleeding disorders in the fam. There is no history of bleeding uh, in the past history. In the family history. There is no history of bleeding disorders in family, no history of children with chromosomal abnormality, no history of twinning in family, no history of diabetes, mellitus, hypertension, TB, or any chronic illness. Sleep pattern was normal, bowel bladder was normal and regular, no history of alcohol intake, smoking, or illicit drug abuse, no drug allergy was found. She belongs to upper lower socioeconomical status according to modified Kupuswami cell. And she was taking mixed style. Uh, history by 24 hour recall method was taken. She consumed 2,500 kilocalories per day and 63 gram of a protein per day, which was adequate for the patient. So, Payal, uh, can you tell us what are the important points in history with respect to the antipartum hemorrhage? Uh, Ma'am, as the patient came with a painless, it was a painless, causeless, and unprovoked bleeding, which was sudden in onset. And uh, her ultrasound shows that she is having low uh, line posterior placenta. And with bleeding, it is the abdominal pain was not associated. So the uh, important you have to you have asked about the number of pairs, clothes, so presence of clothes, and it is very important whether the bleeding is painless or painful because painful bleeding then goes more in favor of abruptio placenti, and uh, it is very important what initiated bleeding. So I have mentioned about intercourse and history of trauma sometimes lead to abruptio placenti, and uh, history of recurrent bleeding color usually bright red color is uh, seen in placenta previa and dark red blood. Uh, blood color is seen in abruptio placenti, especially concealed hemorrhage. And uh, the bleeding has stopped in, in, on its own. So in placenta previa, usually the first bleeding is not that heavy. And uh, so the, your, the, your diagnosis goes. So these are the important points for antipartum hemorrhage. And uh, the bleeding is sudden, bright red, painless. And uh, this is uh, called sentinel bleed, which is rarely so profuse as to prove fatal but it only ceases to recur. And in these cases, usually patients are stable initially, so the fetal heart rate is normal. These patients may present as threatened abortion. In your case, this patient has threatened abortion. Yes. yes. So painful uterine bleeding signifies placental abruption. And the di differential diagnosis is not this straightforward. Labor accompanying previa may cause pain that suggests placental abruption, and conversely, pain from placental abruption may mimic normal labor, or it may be painless, especially with the posterior placenta. At times, the vaginal bleeding source remains obscure even after delivery, especially when it is concealed. So, come to your general examination, Payal. Yes, ma'am. Uh, patient is lying comfortably on examination table. Patient is cooperative, well oriented with time, place, and person. She is moderately built and nourished. Pre-pregnancy weight is 52 kg and present pregnancy weight is 62 kg. Height 155 centimeter and BMI is 21.6 kg per meter square. Hydration was adequate. She is of a to touch, no pallor, sinusis, clubbing, uterus or edema were present. No rodental uh, hygiene fair, no thyromegaly or lymphadenopathy. 
and bilateral plates were showing normal changes of tendency. Uh, white is the pulse rate is 78 beats per minute regular good volume. Blood pressure is 118 by 80 diastolic mm of mercury in left lateral position and respiratory rate was 16 cycle per minute. So is there an association of BP? You told me that BP is normal. So what is the significance of BP in a case of APH? Man, increasing BP associated with abruptio placenta. Because of a vasospasm, there will be endothelial endothelia damage which can lead to abruptio. Yeah. And if BP is low, then patient have bled so much that it has lead to hypovolemia, both in previa and abruptio. Yes. So along with blood pressure pile, what else, which other parameter is equally important when you are examining a case of APH? Mom, pulse is very important. Uh, if, and uh, blood pressure and as well what, as... What, what all do you see in pulse rate? Uh, Ma'am, uh, pulse rate, uh, the volume, and uh, also the character of the uh, pulse. Yes, so volume is very important. Along mm -hmm. with this, nowadays you have another parameter which is also very important. So what is that? When you Shock. take the yes, Shock. to assess to assess the the saturation of the patient. You know, oxygen saturation be abhi. You should always try to see for oxygen saturation also and ask for urine output of the, of the patient. Yes. These are very important things you should assess. Yeah, go ahead, please. On abdominal examination inspection, the, uh, it was uniformly distended. You try and avoid in longitudinal axis. Linea nigra, stria gravidarum seen, and umbilicus is central and inverted. Transverse scar present. No sinuses or dilated veins and hernial orifices are intact. On palpation, local temperature not raised. The uterus was relaxed and non-tender. Abdominal girth 34 inches at the level of umbilicus. Fundal height is 34 weeks, which is correspond to gestational age. Sympatio fundal height is 34 centimeter, correspond to gestational age. On a fundal grip, it was broad, soft, irregular mass, the gesture of breach. And left lateral grip, is uniform continue curve resistant suggestive of spine. Uh, right lateral grip multiple lobe like structures suggestive of fetal limbs. And in a poly grip hard palatable mass suggestive of fetal head. In a pelvic grip fingers are converging, so fetal head was not engaged. And scar tenderness was absent. The lighter head appears clinically adequate. An estimated fetal rate is approximately 2.8 kg plus minus 10 percent. So you said that head is not in case, and sometimes we get male presenta presentation also. So is there any significance of presentation in case of antipartum hemorrhage? Yes, ma'am. Uh, in case of the placenta previa, placenta is locally located in a lower uterine segment. So that can uh, increase the chances of malpresentation. The head is not going to occupy. The... What type of malpresentation can you get? Uh, ma'am, breech presentation, transverse lie, oblique lie, or unstable lie. Yeah. But in abruption, usually we do not get male presentation. Yes. So next. FSH heart along left spinal umbilical line. Rate was 152 beats per minute. It was regular. And on local examination, bright red colored bleeding coming from vagina. No local laceration or injuries present. And first speculum not done in view of active bleeding. So do we do PV examination? No, ma'am. What and happens? Now, unless we rule out placenta previa, we cannot do the... What is the harm if we do PV unless we rule it out? It will provoke bleeding. It will provoke bleeding. It, will cost, it may cause torrential bleeding. It will provoke Okay, yeah. So, Pachu, pehle apna diagnosis batao. Let's have the diagnosis before we go to the investigations. Yes, ma'am. Uh, Ma'am, 30-year-old lady gravitated to Paravan, leaving one 34 uh, weeks of a pregnancy with a previous LACS, likely placenta previa. Achha. So you tell me, why do you think it is placenta previa? You told me a few points. So yeah. what are the features in favor and uh, against? Just revise once again. Uh, Ma'am, it was a painless, cosmetic, and unprovoked sudden onset bleeding, which was not associated with abdominal pain. 
which was uh, seen in a placenta previa and uh, uh, also the ultrasound shows that it is having posterior low lying placenta and she is having recurrent bleeding in the second trimester which was completely resolved on its own hmm. so it can be a local cause also no with the the kind of presentation you have seen can be a local cause so yes. what are the differential diagnosis then hmm. mom it might be a maternal uh, causes like placental abruption or it might be the um, extra placental causes like uh, the excessive show or uterine rupture scar dehydration or a cervical polyp cervical vaginal infection or erosion or uh, the vulvo vaginal varicosities uh, and uh, scar dehydration scar dehydration you have examined the patient since you have examined the patient you have ruled out a lot of co local causes okay so you can defend yourself by saying that you did a speculum examination and the local causes have been ruled out a lot of local causes like what all can be ruled out cervical polyp many erosions like erosion infection and infection and vaginal trauma trauma and Post-coitus is again very common, not very common, but an important cause of APH. Vaginal and cervical varicosities should always be looked for. All right, which can be ruled out by after the examination. So these are the differentials of yeah. APH. So Smita, can you elaborate on the differences of placenta previa and abruption? Because we commonly get these two conditions. Yes, ma'am. It can be differentiated on the basis of history and examination. On the history, it will ask about the bleeding, the pattern of bleeding. In placenta previa, the bleeding is causeless, unprovoked, painless. Whereas in abruption, the, 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 the bleeding is associated with abdominal pain, and there is always some cause behind the bleeding, like the right raised blood pressure or any kind of trauma can be there. On the examination in placenta previa, and for abdominal examination, the abdomen will be soft, non-tender, relaxed. The fetal head will not be engaged. It will be free floating. And the fetal heart sound will be auscultated well. Whereas in case of abruption, the abdomen will be tense, tender, tender on palpation, and the fetal parts cannot be palpated due to extreme tenderness and tense. And uh, the fetal heart sound will be audible depending upon the severity of abruption. Exactly, exactly. So this is a very this is very beautiful chart showing the differences. Uh, students can take a uh, screenshots of this chart. She has almost said about all the main points. Uh, abruption is usually associated with coagulopathy, but it is less common in previa. And uh, ultrasound diagnosis is easier with previa. In all the cases of abruption cannot be diagnosed by ultrasound. So the National Health Institute divides placenta into placenta previa into low lying placenta and marginal placenta. This is a new definition now. Low lying placenta is defined as implantation in the lower segment, which is such that the placental is does not cover the internal os, but lies within two centimeter wide perimeter around the os. And marginal previa means placenta that was at the edge of the internal os, but did not overlay it. A low lying placenta at 2 cm dilatation may become a partial previa at 4 cm dilatation because the cervix is open to expose the placental edge. And the placenta previa that appears to be total before cervical dilatation may become partial at 4 cm dilatation because the cervical opening now extends beyond the edge of the placenta. So these are the pictures of placenta previa. And this is, if for speculum examination, then this is the look. Uh, per speculum examination is not completely contraindicated. It is not in, done in heavy bleeding, but with mild bleeding, it can be done, but never a PV examination. So, uh, Smita, yes, what are the risk factors for placenta previa? Oh, with respect to this patient also? Yes, ma'am. Ma what the is the risk factor? Previous history of placenta previa and previous pregnancy, number one. Number two is previous cesarean section, as this patient is having a previous cesarean section. This has increased the risk of placenta previa. The age of age and parity, with advancing age and with advancing parity, the chances of placenta previa increases. Uh, with uh, uh, decidual uh, and with end of spontaneous abortion or with uh, medical termination of pregnancy, and uh, with uterine ablation, 
and any surgery. Medical termination of pregnancy per se will it increase the risk? Dilatation and curing that that will yes. cause. So, so your patient had carpal yeah. insert, post placental. Yes, ma'am. उसका क्या हुआ था बाद में? Ma'am, when she planned, ma'am, she came. She as the patient told that she wanted to conceive. She visited our OPD. So, so that history is important. That whether the cavity yeah. was removed uneventfully or whether it was embedded or any procedure had to be carried out. Okay, we missed no, that in the history. Yeah, For any intrauterine uh, device, the history of removal is equally important. And uh, your patient uh, had a cesarean. Yes, in last pregnancy, then this previous cesarean, that's a very good history of taken that previous cesarean predisposes yes. the incidence of placenta previa. Yes. And especially when the placenta is posterior, the chances of going up are also less. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma so we are talking so much about placenta previa to intervene in time. So what are the complications of placenta previa? Ma'am, uh, there are maternal complications and fetal complications. In the maternal complication in antenatal period, as she is having the recurrent vaginal bleeding, then she can go to have T severe anemia. She can go to hemorrhagic shock, and there will be mild presentation. There will be a premature rupture of membrane during labor, or cord prolapse can be there. Intrapartum hemorrhage or a postpartum hemorrhage can be there, or retained placenta that can lead to peripheral sepsis. And uh, there will be sub involution of the uterus. Because what are the fetal problems which can occur? Uh, Ma'am, uh, low birth weight can happen, premature mm -hmm. restriction can happen. So, first you have to tell the chances of premature termination mm -hmm. of pregnancy you may do. So, prematurity is one of the common cause also. Yes, so, these are the maternal and fetal complications. Uh, fetal hypoxia is more for gestational age and fetal growth restriction, prematurity. You know, it's a very important cause. And sometimes fetal death, especially fetal death, occur in abrupt show placenta because there is significant blood loss in the placenta. And uh, that's why we say that this anemia must be treated before placenta previa because it worsens the condition. Over to Dr. Kamala. So uh, another question, had your patient uh, had only one episode in her uh, first trimester, no? she had an episode of bleeding. Is she also, does she become a high risk uh, pregnancy even with one episode or you can consider her as, uh, her as a normal antenatal patient? One no. episode of bleeding, will, will it make her prone to any complications? And if yes, yes what all? Yes, ma'am, it will become a high risk pregnancy. It can lead to preterm labor in later pregnancy period. It can lead to abortion. Yes. Abruption also in later half of Yes. So she is again prone to abruption, oligohydromnose, preterm labor, PROM. Okay. So even one episode of bleeding, like a patient of threatened abortion, should be taken as a high risk pregnancy. Okay. So uh, should we screen all women for placenta previa? And how do you follow up? Once you have, uh, like her second trimester ultrasound suggested the placenta was low lying. So how do you follow up these women? Uh, Ma'am, in the as in the second trimester we get the low line placenta. We will mm -hmm. going to uh, repeat the scan at 32 weeks of the gestation to see the persistent of the uh, location of the placenta. Okay. Persist then at a 36 weeks uh, we are going to repeat the ultrasound to uh, for the mode of a delivery. For the mode of the delivery. Uh, for the mode of the no, delivery. For the mode of delivery is. Or but for the persistence, just, huh. persistence of the. Uh, yes, it is for the persistence of the placenta. And now at thirty-six weeks of gestation, when you are seeing the placenta, what all things will you see now, which will help you manage the case, especially uh, your case. Uh, Ma'am, as uh, she is the uh, she is uh, her. Previous pregnancy is by LSA, so we were going to check the ret retroplacental area and mm -hmm. uh, also the fetal presentation and uh, fetal growth and AFI mm -hmm. as well as cervical length uh, in this article. So when you do a scan at 32 weeks, along with seeing the localization of the placenta, you also have to look at all these factors. Take care. Okay. 
so uh, now suppose uh, acha now since you have touched this uh, point how do you diagnose uh, placenta accreta what all do you see in this retro placental area um, uh, we will see the clear zone uh, if the we get the hypoechoic area uh, which is normally present if it is accreta you they will be absent of clear zone and uh, i am taking you to that slide uh myometrial Myometrial thinning. Yes. Myometrial thinning will be there. Thinning will be there. There will be accent of bladder line, which represents in the case of a uterine and serosa, and uh, also there will be lacunation and placental bulging and uh, the focal exudative muscles. These are features we as gynecologists should also be able to at least suspect. Because yeah. many a times your patient will come with bleeding and you will have to terminate her. You will have to decide on yeah. termination of pregnancy. So you you will be the only practitioner there to see the ultrasound. So these things should be uh, known to all gynecologists. Okay. Yeah. Acha, what is the role of TVS here? TVS. Man, for Man, for Man, for Man, for Man, for Man, for because in France, yeah. and sometimes full, full bladder may artificially not get the cervix. So <laughs> that we get, we get a false impression. So TBS is always better. And in women with persistent low line placenta at 32 weeks gestation who remain asymptomatic, then we, we offer a additional TBS at around 36 weeks. So this is a picture of, can you elaborate on this? What is this? Where is placenta previa showing? Complete placenta previa. Yeah, so this is a transvaginal image at 21 weeks. Okay. It is showing placenta completely yes. covering the internal loss. So any idea about migration of placenta? Because sometimes we usually say that placenta was seen lower and then later on it has gone up. Yes. In your case, yeah. Ma'am, is the normal. Migration of placenta, it is, uh, there is a tropotropism and uh, differential growth of the lower uterine segment and upper uterine segment. Tropotropism is the uh, placental growth is occurring more vascular area. And yeah. there will be a So in 80% of the cases, placenta goes up. Yes. Right. But usually, if it is a posterior placenta, that is just less likely to go up. So, uh, uh, already said by Dr. Kamna that you have to roll out placenta accreta spectrum if a case is previous cesarean because previous cesarean in, increases the inc incidence of placenta accreta spectrum. Mm -hmm. And this is a very important line written in RCOG guideline that previous cesarean delivery in the presence of an anterior low line. If it is an anterior low line placenta previa, then it should alert the antenatal care team of the higher risk of placenta accreta spectrum because it is. A very great condition in obstetrics with significant maternal and perinatal mortality. So whenever you find the case of previous cesarean with anterior low-lying placenta previa and no further imaging facilities available like MRI, then take, it, take this as a case of placenta percreta or accreta and with all preparations, you manage the patient's multidisciplinary team. This has already been discussed. Uh, now, suppose if this USA facility is not available, your patient is nearing term, you have to rule out placenta, so what will you do? Ma'am, uh, we will do the uh, double uh, set vaginal examination in operation uh, theater, uh, telling all the risk factors to the patient as well as the relative. And uh, uh, for during this procedure, two scrub teams should be available. Uh, for the vaginal examination and at the abdominal uh, end for the Absol absolutely right. So basically, two surgical teams are required. <laughs> so how do you how do you do PV examination when you are suspe suspecting low lying placenta? Uh, so the vaginal team, yeah. Sorry, ma'am. Ha, vaginal end pe khade ho, So how will you proceed? Uh, ma'am, uh, the Ma'am, we are going to uh, first this procedure can be done in general anesthesia or without general anesthesia. Mm -hmm. No, no, PV examination mm -hmm. is not done under anesthesia, Mitter. Mm -hmm. 
पार्ट through the phonesis only then you proceed further yes, if the phonesis are boggy that is an indication that there is something uh, between some present are low lying between the head and the, the internal cervical os okay. so in that case you, you will ask the other team to go ahead or if there is bleeding and you are able to palpate then also you ask the other team to go ahead yeah okay so, so this okay. is one option but most of the time we have ultrasound ha aap to yeah but aapko pata hona yeah. chahiye तो अब पेशेंट थर्ड ट्राइमेस्टर में है एंड शी इज हैविंग प्लेसेंटा प्रीवियर वी हैव डायग्नोज्ड सो व्हाट विल व्हाट एडवाइस विल यू गिव टू हर मैम द पेशेंट मैम द पेशेंट शुड बी एक्सप्लेन अबाउट ऑल द रिस्क ऑफ प्लेसेंटा प्रीवियर शी शुड शी शुड बी शुड कन्वे द मैसेज दैट इफ शी ब्लिंक एनी टाइम शी शुड गो टू द हॉस्पिटल इमीडिएटली and she should be in a resident in clear the transportation facility should be available uh, and if she comes with recurrent bleeding we should admit such patients and should explain all the risk to her she should always be referred to a center that is well equipped with icu facility and icu facility yes uh, well equipped center blood transfusion facility so the bleeding is not uh, the initial bleeding is not uh, very high so usually we do a conservative method it used to be called the mcafee's regimen earlier uh, the absolute rest and supportive management and if the patient is asymptomatic then what will you do ma'am if the patient is asymptomatic then we are going to plan her uh, uh, delivery according to the uh, grading of the placenta and and according to the location of the placenta and uh, uh, we are going to admit her at 36 weeks of gestation okay. and suppose you have your patient is admitted with you this patient okay. and her bleeding has stopped so will you discharge her or what uh ma'am we can see in the hospital only ma'am If she is residing in nearby hospital where transportation facilities are available, if patient yeah. is not willing to stay, then only we will tell her. To whether we will advise her to stay in the hospital. Yeah. So if uh, the bleeding has stopped, then patient can come to hospital any time. Then you can discharge her. You should advise her abstinence and uh, pelvic rest. Yes. Yeah. So is there any role of circles? No, ma'am. No, ma But if you find a patient at eighteen uh, weeks with the short cervix with the low lying placenta, will you go ahead with circlage or will you not? No, ma'am. We will not go. We will not do circlage. No, no. Nay, nay. You don't put a circlage to prove. <laughs> no, <laughs> no, ma'am. We will not prove. No. See, sir. Low lying placenta is not a contraindication to putting sir uh, circlage, but yes, you don't put a circlage just to prolong pregnancy in a case of yes, low lying placenta. Yes, ma'am. ठीक है, दोनों वाइसा वर्षा नहीं है. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Doctor Kamna. हाँ जी. तो अब now you your patient is thirty six weeks plus suppose ठीक है thirty seven. What 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 is the suppose your patient who is uh, have who had two episodes of Uh, slight bleeding in her uh, pregnancy. Now she has reported to you at thirty-six plus five weeks of gestation. So how do you now plan her uh, delivery, her mode of delivery, and what all precautions will you take? How do you plan her delivery now? Ma'am, we are going to uh, uh, suggest her for the admission because we are going to plan the termination of pregnancy at thirty-seven weeks. First, we are mm -hmm. going to arrange the blood products uh, and. Uh, Uh, for uh, we are see we are going to inform the case to our senior obstetrician gynecologist and also mm -hmm. we are going to check the availability of the uh, blood and availability of the uh, an icu admission and also the icu bed should be available if uh, there any complication related to 
और हाउ मच ब्लड विल यू आस्क योर ब्लड यू हैव टू बी वेरी क्लियर इन योर इंस्ट्रक्शन ठीक है राइट फ्रॉम टेकिंग कंसेंट to uh, to your uh, the method of uh, uh, surgery you are going to perform the anesthetist what are you going to explain the blood bank the icu people the anesthetist your senior obstetrician the patient's relatives sab kuch batao is a practical oh. thing hmm. ma'am we are going to explain all the high risk to the uh, relative as well as the what patient. what do you mean by high risk uh ma'am the patient uh, can have the pph and uh, she can go into the shock there is a need of icu admission there mm -hmm. might be say uh, uterine uh, or uh, uterine or bladder injury uh, or mm -hmm. transfusion or blood transfusion yes. related reaction yes. and also mm -hmm. the aesthetic complication we are going to uh, tell them mm -hmm. and uh, admission of uh, the nicu admission for the baby Uh, uh, can be required आपकी प्रेगनेंसी क्यों हो सकती है ऑलवेजिस and as do you care so uh, would you like to give steroids in your case uh, yes ma'am she is a 34 week uh, as she is having weeks of periods of gestation then uh, we will give got it steroids one dose yeah. of so it is recommended between 34 to 35 plus 6 almost 36 weeks of pregnancy you know later if it is given it it, it not only corrects uh, uh, prevents the respiratory membrane disease it also prevents necrotizing enterocolitis in the fetus so is there any place for the use of tocolytics uh ma'am there is uh, means the tocolytics is not recommended but uh, if she is came with a preterm labor then for the corticosteroid to buy the time uh, yeah. for it we can give a tocolytics so when i was going through the literature in most in uh, most of the literature it is written that corticos this tocolytic should not be given as the physiological cardiovascular response to response to tocolytic agent includes hypotension and tachycardia that can mask maternal compromise but according to few literatures it may be considered for 48 hours to facilitate the administration of congenital corticosteroid at this point i would like to add ma'am yeah. You yeah. should be aware of magnesium, uh, the provision of magnesium sulfate for neuroprotection because yes, we might yes, yes. need right. to terminate the pregnancy prematurely. Yes, absolutely right, Doctor Kamla. Thank you. So, when are you planning your delivery, Doctor Kamla? You can take this question. Ha ha, we partly covered. Mm. So, when do you plan? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Tell us, Mr. Pai. Yeah. Yes. Ma'am, uh, in my patient, she is. Uh, we managed her conservatively, and uh, uh, so in this patient, we are going to plan her delivery at thirty-seven weeks. But if she has uh, the continued bleeding, or uh, there is an indication like uh, fetal distress, then I am going to do the uh, cesarean section immediately. So, in other words, what are the indications of immediate, imminent, uh, immediate termination of pregnancy in a case of APH? Ma'am, if there is a torrential bleeding which is not uh, controlled, yes. and uh, if there is a fetal distress, and if there is other right. obstetric indications, uh, and uh, uh, if she is completed thirty-seven weeks, then uh, we are going to do yes. cesarean section. Yes, yes, yes. Okay, and uh, as far as the mode of delivery is concerned, any comments there? Mummy, if it is the uh, type one or according to old classification, if it is type one, type two placenta previa, type then uh, type two A, uh, then we can go with for with the vaginal delivery. But in a type two posterior and type three and type four placenta previa, uh, we will go with the elective cesarean section. Yeah. So in most, in fact, most in most of the cases, cesarean section is done unless it is type one or type two. 
Okay. Never in posterior. So prevention and treatment of anemia during antenatal period is also very, very important for preventing complications. So this has already been discussed, arrangements we have discussed. So, because see, now that the, the classification has been changed for a reason, no, abo anterior yeah. posterior wala it's an it is only two okay. centimeters. Yeah, because we generally prefer cesarean delivery here. Okay. Hmm. So, any preference for anesthesia? Uh, yes, ma'am. Ma we will, uh, the, uh, miss, uh, the anesthetist yes. will prefer regional anesthesia because it decreases the chances of hemorrhage. Yes. And uh, what, what are you going to tell the anesthetist so that uh, your anesthetist is more uh, um, cautious during the surgery? You uh, should tell your anesthetist regarding the anticipation of complications like. Uh, what is the most important complication which may occur, about which you are worried about? Ma'am, patient can have the uh, uh, postpartum hemorrhage. Yeah. And, That's uh, where PPH can occur. Yes, you have, to, yes. be yes. Yes. You have so, to be well prepared for that. Yeah. So, so you have to tell the anesthesia also, maybe he has started in regional anesthesia, but she might require the conversion to the anesthesia anytime when significant PPH happens. Hmm. And the patient should also be informed about this. So just very, in only one line, because this is not a class on PPH, just in one line, what products will you keep ready? Ma'am, uh, PC, uh, PCV should be uh, kept ready, four units of PCV, FFP should also be kept ready, and and the suppose if PP... <laughs> exactly same question, yeah. <laughs> suppose if PPH happens, so this yes, ratio map doge? Mm -hmm. One is to one to one now. How much blood will you ask your blood mm -hmm. bank to keep arranged before you take her for cesarean? A blood bank may ek unity mila to fair? Four units of blood to be kept. Four units of each. Each now. Each yes, no. Yeah. So <clears throat> Regarding surgical approach, now you have to send cesarean to the cesarean. Smita, you go and do the cesarean. So Smita, will you take any precaution? Yes, ma'am. Uh, in case of low-lying placenta, we can go for inframlical vertical incision. We can do that to help in rapidly reaching the peritone. Why do you want to give a vertical incision? Ma'am, in case of severe hemorrhage. Yes, we may need to explore completely. We may need to perform a sterectomy or internal ligation if severe PPH occurs. So uh, with longitudinal incision, the exposure is better. And what else? What other precautions? Other, ma'am, if you're doing trans, uh, lower segment trans, uh, lower segment cesarean section, then we'll, we'll be, we'll can see the placenta site easily and we can be controlled easily in that case. That is the best. Before, you, before you give the uterine incision, you should you always... You have to observe something. Ah, before you give the uterine incision. Yes, ma'am. Uh, we have to see the anterior surface of the uterus. Yes, yes. Blood yes. Blood vessels. And at that particular moment, you also rule out placenta percrete or increte or accrete. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, and if it is found there, please don't touch it. Call your senior. Yes, okay. And it is said that in peripheral centers, if you open and you see a placenta percrete or increte, then please close the abdomen and send the patient to a higher center. Okay. Yes. So. And now the placenta percrita has been ruled out and we are giving an incision. Mm -hmm. So what precaution will you take? Ma'am, we can touch through the placenta to deliver the baby, but immediately... Will you, will you go through the placenta and cut through the placenta? Um, we can, no, ma'am, we should give... Uh, uh, what is the preferred method? Classical... Uh, uh, mm -hmm. Classical incision should... No, 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 no. Classical. No, 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 no. Not always a classical incision. Classical incision give we give in placenta equita spectrum, not in placenta previa, not always. Do you agree with me, Dr. Kamna? Absolutely, ma'am. Uh -huh. So at the time of making an incision, you take precautions. Suppose you have given incision on the segment, lower segment. Now, what precaution will you take while delivering the baby? Well, immediately clamp the cord and hand over the baby. No, my dear, I did not do uh, Payal, will you elaborate? What is the method of delivery of the baby? Do you really cut through the placenta? Oh, I've uh, given you a lead. Preferred method, oh, Betha. The meat on the uterus, and yes. you, you, we are going to uh, give a leak on the small incision on the uterus, and 
then we can put our finger and separate the uh, memory. Uh, yes, yes, yes. With the uh, uterine wall. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, so you have to rupture the membrane. Go by the side of the placenta. You rupture the membrane and deliver baby from there. Okay. And nowadays, we have an ultrasound machine available at all hours. No, you, yeah. you should always put a probe and try to find your incision line before yeah. we leave the patient to OT. That will help you a lot in the OT. And Spita, now by accident, you have cut through the placenta. Yes. Now, what will you do? Ma'am, we have to meet it. Clamp the cord and deliver the baby immediately. Yeah, you have to do, expedite the delivery and you have to clamp the cord completely because now there is fetal loss occurring. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, so now following placental removal, as I was fearing, the implantation site is bleeding. So, what will you do? Uh, Ma'am, we are going to take, uh, take the suture, take, take the suture in the placental side to decrease the bleeding, or we can put in uh, with that we can put the. Uh, put and the any specific type of sutures? Uh, Ma'am, uh, we can have a breast suture or a chest square suture or a hemming suture. No, 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 no. The lower segment is bleeding. Lower segment is bleeding. So, what type of breast suture do you want to give on lower segment? Shows usually you give an upper segment, you may give, but besides shows, okay, you can call it a figure of eight sutures also. And which suture material is preferred? Um, we will use vicryl. Vicryl or catgut? Catgut. So, number zero chromic catgut or number one zero chromic no, catgut is considered good as per Williams. And uh, you can give figure of eight sutures, circle sutures, or compression sutures, all these type of sutures. So, and the bleeding did not stop with this, then what else? Quickly, in only in 30 seconds, because again, this is not a class of people. Suture failed. Ma'am, we will do the. Uh, you should not. You can apply your... a hot pack also. That you should remember. To have the hot pack for the uterine balloon tamponade can be done with the suture. Yes, yes, not yes. The vascularization of the blood. Uh, yeah, stepwise devascularization, uterine artery ligation. Yes, yes, ma'am. Um, Anasto, uterine and ovarian artery anastomosis ligation and internal yes. artery ligation if required. And in very few cases, very rarely. Hysterectomy is required. And you also give uterotonics. Uh, usually, in very significant abruption placenta, we do require hysterectomy because severe atonic PPH happens. But remember one line early recourse to hysterectomy is recommended if conservative medical and surgical interventions are ineffective. And in placenta previa, uh, the common teaching is cesarean hysterectomy. Placenta patuita. So fetal outcome we have discussed. This we, I think Dr. Kamna, we have discussed everything. We can omit this and we can move to a practical right. facility. Yeah. Right? Right. So over to you, Dr. Kamna. And now, Chalo, uh, we uh, suppose you have to present a case. Your patient who came with bleeding, uh, she has come with bleeding. What are the signs, symptoms which will help you say that this is a case of uh, abruptio placenta? We're mostly done. You've already said a lot of things. Um, in case of abruptual placenta, the patient will complain with bleeding that is associated with abdominal pain. There will be some cause behind the bleeding, like she may have a raised BP cause, and there may be history of any trauma to the patient. Not always, not always. There is a cause behind the bleeding, but yeah, but yes, your patient will be symptomatic. Symptomatic, yes, ma'am. Yes. Uh, ah. the examination, the blood on one examination, the blood will be dark red in color. There will be clots present, and on per abdominal examination, the abdomen will be tense, tender. The fetal parts may not be palpable due to tense uh, abdomen. Fetal heart sound may be audible if the abruption is of uh, less severe degree, and it may be absent in case of severe uh, degree abruption. And her vitals, don't forget her vitals. You have you are saying examination, so, yeah. Um, so the shock is usually out of proportion. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Yeah. Bleeding which you can see, and the signs are usually out of proportion of that. 
Yeah. And because of concealed hemorrhage, sometimes we cannot understand and patient goes into shock. And if there is significant coagulopathy, then it may lead to loss of fetal heart sound, fetal death may occur. So what are the risk factors for abruptio placenti? The um, commonly, you first tell the common things first, which you see in your words. Now, if the patient has a history of a previous uh, uh, abruptio placenta, increase in maternal age and increase in maternal age, uh, multiparity and the previous Just one minute. What is more important? A history of pre previous abruptio placenta or history of something else, which you see commonly in your words? Uh, Ma'am, in high uh, Pre yeah, it is it is hypertensive disease of pregnancy, which is very commonly seen with the blood sugar person. Yeah. What else? Trauma in this history, any trauma? Yeah, yeah. Trauma causes dust causes as per literature, dust causes abrupt sugar person, and then but then then there is a history always. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And it can be seen, it is also seen uh, uh, more in black and in white people. And less in Asia. And, uh, black, white people can say important things. Polycacid deficiency also predisposes. Polycacid deficiency can measure. Ma'am, smoking. Yeah. Ma'am, okay. Okay. anyway. So, uh, age, you, you could have told me is uh, mm -hmm. maternal is more than 35 years and chorioamnitis. Ma'am, yes. Breathe and ruptured membrane. Na, na. Mm -hmm. ha, okay. So, Hypertensive disease of pregnancy is the most frequent condition associated with placental abruption. At, it includes gestational hypertension, preeclampsia, chronic hypertension, or a combination. And sometimes it is many a times which is associated with HELP syndrome also. So over to Dr. Kamna. Okay. Yeah. So what are the different types of, you can see a variety of patients with abruption. What are the different types of abruption? Uh, Ma'am, most commonly we see the male type of abruption and uh, the revealed type and concealed type. Mm -hmm. uh, Ma'am, in the revealed type, we will see the uh, we are uh, we will see the external bleeding to the os, mm -hmm. and uh, in the mixed type, we will see the uh, external bleeding also and the retroplacental clot also, and uh, mm -hmm. in the concealed hemorrhage. Uh, we will not see any external bleeding. The bleeding is occurring retroplacent. Yeah. So all the so signs is, you were saying are more prominent with concealed hemorrhage. Mm -hmm. Concealed. Yeah. So you can draw this diagram in theory exam also. Very good sketchy diagram of concealed hemorrhage and revealed hemorrhage. I've taken this picture from Williams. And very important uh, is that in abruption, the source of bleeding is the? Yes, yes, yes. Okay. It is maternal, maternal. All signs. All signs are uh, very uh, obvious and prominent here. Yeah. So uh, we are omitting this question, Dr. Kamna, because of okay, lack of okay. time. Nowadays, these are not discussed much. If any old examiner asks you, then these are the grades. It's written in older books, so you can go through it. OK? Yes. Uh, OK, so now coming to the investigations, Dr. Kamna. OK, any, any other different investigation you will do in the, if you're suspecting abruption, or we move ahead? We have discussed investigations for placenta previa. For any APH case, you do a series of investigations and more so when you are suspecting abruption. Bolo. Ma'am, coagulation profile. Uh, hmm. Very good. Hmm. Is the, uh, why? Ma'am, because there are more chances the patient can go to DIC. Yeah, it can be a cause also. It can be a result also. Exactly, okay. exactly. Yeah. So you have to find out the coagulation profile. Okay. So, abruption is mainly a diagnosis of clinical suspicion. It is mainly a clinical diagnosis, yeah. So, coagulation profile mein kya kya karoge? Ye bhi bata do jaldi se, Dr. Kamna ko. And, uh, bleeding time, clotting time, uh, protein time, APTP, uh, serum fibrinogen level, FDP, uh, Aapko na in sab ka, the values in pregnancy is different. Okay. So whenever you are trying to interpret the results, see the pregnant values during pregnancy. Most of these values are almost two to three times during pregnancy. So interpret the results yeah. with the person. Okay. And, uh, and always correlated with clinical condition. Yes. And the BTCT, you can always, you should should not stop the practicing, uh, uh, should not stop the practice of performing BTCT examination uh, at bedside. And you should also do the CRT test. 
that is very important so i'm just yeah, showing this all yeah. pg should know how to do a bt ct and what are the uh, what is the relevance of these basic test the yeah. exam questions were favorite thing and all, all on 50 to 6 70% of examiners do ask about crt yeah. so you should know that clot retraction test <laughs> okay so <laughs> this is just picture i got from one good literature so i am just sharing that it is all types of hematomas whether it is subcorionic or it is pre placental or it is retro placental they all are come, all come in the category of abrupt placenta so this we have already discussed uh, sometimes sonography helps when we get retroplacental clot and uh, it is written that uh, in literature that MRI is very highly sensitive for, for placental abruption, more sensitive than USG. So now patient has abruption and patient, uh, you have, uh, your patient did not get any treatment. So what co complications are there which can happen in an untreated case of placental abruption? Because it leads to a high maternal mortality and perinatal mortality. So Tell me. And to DIC Yeah. Rather, I should say that this conjunctive coagulopathy <laughs> is that <laughs> abruptio placenti is most commonly associated with conjunctive coagulopathy mm -hmm. in obstetrics. <laughs> and in one literature, it is written that in all conditions, the commonest cause of conjunctive coagulopathy is abruptio placenti. <laughs> what else besides this? Acute <laughs> Acute kidney injury can tell totally. mm -hmm. uh, What are the what are the problems? Uh, what are the types of problems with acute kidney, kidney injury? It occurs in ten percent of cases. Yes, uh, when hypovolemia is not treated in time, right? Yes. What else? Mama, patient had the hemorrhagic shock and yeah. uh, uh, the pain. And postpartum hemorrhage also. Postpartum yes. hemorrhage. So DIC shock, history of requirement of transfusion, even hysterectomy for very severe tonic PPH, all this you've told, and fetal complications you have already told. Uh, fetal congenital anomalies, this issue I've taken, this is this has association with placental abruption, okay. just pointed out one thing. And uh, some degree of intervascular coagulation is almost universal in abruption of placenta. And this we have already discussed. This is the commonest cause of conjunctive coagulopathy in obstetrics and probably in all specialties. And this conjunctive coagulopathy is more common in concealed abruption mm -hmm. because thromboplastin is pushed into the large veins. And uh, besides this, we can have dilutional coagulopathy when thrombocytopenia occurs and severe hypo hypofibrinogenemia occurs. So every time we are telling this pres present your abruption when it is severe enough to cause fetal death, severe enough. So what is the definition of severity of presental abruption? Kaba presental abruption ko severe bolo gives, but kya hoga? Uh, Ma'am, the, uh, the maternal shock can happen with coagulopathy and there will be fetal death. Yes. That is. Okay. So, uh, maternal sequelae that includes DIC, shock, transfusion, hysterectomy, renal failure, and death. Fetal sequelae, non reassuring fetal status, growth restriction, and death. Neonatal outcome, death, preterm delivery, growth restriction. They all are fulfilling the criteria for severe presental abruption. It's beautifully written in Williams. Mm -hmm. Ma'am, in chronic abruption, the abruption might have occurred in early trimesters, but it is not followed by delivery. It is called chronic okay. abruption. Okay, okay, okay. Perfectly fine. So it is called chronic abruption oligohydramnio sequence. Mm -hmm. So traumatic abruption, just I put this slide to make all the students aware that there is something called abruptio placenti due to trauma and usually it happens in motor vehicles and it is usually advisable to apply a belt while traveling. So regarding kidney injury, I just want to say that acute kidney injury uh, means different type. It doesn't include only acute tubular necrosis, but uh, 
it's a general term which describes Reynolds dysfunction. And in this we have already discussed. The thing is that when hypovolume occurs, then you have to rush the crystalloids around two to three liters in 15 minutes and uh, till the blood arrives. So this is very important. A lot this of is very, very important, yes. A lot of patients go into AKI after... Uh, uh, yeah. massive, uh, I, I'm just telling you one incident. Uh, uh, once my resident called me up and he say, she said that uh, present uh, BP is uh, going low and... Uh, uh, I said you give blood, you give you uh, give IV fluids fast. So she told me, madam, isko to anemia hai, bahut jada, isko blood be fast kyon do? Ye pulmonary edema me chala, chali jayegi. So my answer is this: that this patient has an acute hemorrhage, and she needs mm -hmm. IV fluids. Wo pulmonary edema me nahi jayegi. It is, it is, it is, it will not cause any pulmonary edema. Then, the other again, a word, die of of Haan, a word of caution: be careful in a case of heart disease. Yes. <laughs> Where, yeah, where the cardiac functions are compromised, you have to be very, very cautious with giving fluids. Yes. So important here is again catheterize the patient when you when you receive such exactly. a patient. Do, do that uh, before doing all. Matlab, simultaneous aapka, because you never know she is already in AKA right, when, right. You are, when you are transfusing so much of patients, absolutely so much right. Of yeah. Her kidneys are not working. So uh, keep a strict watch on the urine output while you are delivering such a case. And whenever acute hemorrhage occurs that leads to hypovolemia, low BP, you will always rush the crystalloids till the blood comes. Okay. So two, uh, two, two liters means four bottles of ringer selected. So this we have, you have already told. Yeah, come on. Yeah, carry on, Dr. Kamna. But these cases are the ones who require multidisciplinary approach. Yes, yes, yes. Keep your anesthetist involved. Yeah. So regarding management, anyone, Dr. Kamna, a question to over to you. Yeah. Now, since we, we are uh, dealing with the, a case of abruption, so you have different scenarios, mild, moderate, severe abruption at different gestations. To summarize fast, how do you manage? How do you decide? Uh, Ma'am, uh, we are going to admit, uh, assist the blood loss and uh, yes. uh, going to see the fetal status. If the fetus is dead, then uh, really important care fetus is less important maternal status is always more important okay if your patient is hemodynamically stable or unstable this is the okay. most important uh, sign or important thing which will decide further management okay yes, if your patient is stable then you see for the fetus and mm -hmm. the gestational age ha uh, abolo uh, ma'am uh, ma if the mother is stable uh, vitally stable then yeah. we can go with the for, with the uh, vaginal delivery. We can do the amniotomy, uh, amniotomy yeah. and uh, uh, start the oxytocin for the vaginal delivery. And if the mother is unstable, there is a fetal distress. If the bleeding is persistent, then we are going to resuscitate her, and then we will take her for the cesarean section by uh, doing the all the prerequisite for the cesarean section, like blood grouping, cross matching, and all the blood investigation. Okay, would you prefer, why do you want to do amniotomy here? Ma'am, it will accelerate the labor and also it will decrease the intrauterine pressure uh, and uh, uh, will control, control the bleeding by the fetal part is going to compress the uh, bleeding part so and decrease the bleeding. Okay. So Suppose you're... Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. Thank you. Yes, Dr. Kamla, please carry on. Thank you. Okay, okay. And so if you this is for your for a stable patient. If your if your patient is going in shock, then how do you manage? Ma'am, we are going to uh, put a two bore, uh, large bore IV cannulas, uh, especially a 14 days uh, gray cannula. I'm going to give the crystalloid and colloids. Uh, and uh, simultaneously, we are going to uh, check the pulse BP respiratory rate and uh, take the blood for the sampling for the investigation, all the coagulation profile and blood grouping cross matching. And uh, uh, resuscitate the patient, uh, put her on the left lateral position, give her oxygen, and uh, also uh, warm the patient. And uh, yes, very good. Mm -hmm. So, where do you allow vaginal delivery in yes. these cases? Mom, if the fetus is alive and uh, uh, even if the fetus is dead, uh, the bishop score is good. if the bishop score is good, the, the bishop bishop. cervix is favorable for the vaginal delivery, we can do the amniotomy and uh, 
So when the fetus is there, usually we try for a vaginal delivery yeah. and we perform cesarean only when the patient's condition is very, very unstable. Then we have to perform the cesarean in order to expedite the delivery and control hemorrhage. Yes. Okay. Again, in this case also, like we did in placenta, we have consent informing all uh, uh, other disciplines. It becomes very important. Yes. Taking so, proper consent is man, very important in such cases. So what is this, Payal? Ma'am, this is covalent uterus. Uh, have you seen in your uh, OT? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma this yes, is my own photograph. Yes, ma One of my cases photograph, yeah. So... Any, does it create any problem? Uh, Ma'am, uh, it is more seen in a concealed abruptio placenta. When the uh, extravasation of intravasation of a blood is into the uterine my, mm -hmm. myometrial, and it can lead to postpartum hemorrhage because the uterine contraction mm -hmm. is not uh, because of a tonic uterus. Because no. of a most of the time, most of the time, the scuvillier uterus contracts and does not lead to postpartum hemorrhage. Most of the time. And most of the time, it does not require any hysteric uh -huh. the, the thing is that it only seen like this and it contracts. Yes. Okay. So usually it contracts, you only have to give uterotonics. It is not an indication for hysterectomy per se. So, amitomy, uh, Dr. Tamna has already discussed. Uh, just uh, one part I would like to tell that it achieves better spiralogic compression to diminish in implant exercise bleeding. This we have already discussed what are the circumstances where vaginal delivery is not preferable, even with date fetus, when the hemorrhage is very risk, risk or any obstetric complication that prohibit vaginal delivery in general. So expected men is we do only when the baby is immature, when the fetus is immature. So we are just summarizing this. This is what we are doing. We are sharing one algorithm. Well, those students can take a screenshot of these algorithms. When the fetus is near term alive, if dead, then we try for vaginal delivery. And uh, if fails to progress, then we do cesarean. And if there is any contraindication to vaginal delivery, then we also perform cesarean. Now, if the fetus is alive, then if the fetal heart is reassuring, we go for a vaginal delivery. It is very good, very good algorithm. And if there are contraindications to vaginal delivery, if the fetal heart rate is non reassuring, or if the mother is hemodynamically unstable, then we perform cesarean delivery to expedite everything. But then these patients are the ones who require continuous electronic fetal monitoring. Yeah. If they are at a very high risk of sudden IUDs. Yes. yes. So again, fetus alive less than 24 weeks, we assess. And if mother becomes unstable, we deliver. If she's stable, we manage conservatively because we have to balance between the prematurity and the delivery. And if fetus is more than 24 weeks, then we assess. And whenever it becomes unstable, we deliver. And if after assessment, fetal heart rate is reassuring, then we manage conservatively because we have to achieve a maturity. And we have, if uh, fetus is still remote from term, then if steroids are indicated, we have to give tocolytics for steroids if required, and then regular monitoring and deliver between 37 to 38 weeks if provided mother is stable. So we will come to placenta accreta. The, the, just I want to tell only one line about placenta accreta spectrum. We have discussed the ultrasound and we have discussed that it is one of the most dreaded condition in obstetrics. Uh, and the standard, there are many types of treatment, conservative, this, that, focal, local. But for your, for you people, remember only one thing that we perform a cesarean hysterectomy, placenta in C2. Placenta is never separated because if we try to separate placenta, then it will bleed like anything. And it is preferable always to perform an internal allic artery ligation first and then go for a cesarean hysterectomy. And patients requires multiple and massive blood transfusion many a times. So uh, now I'm going to, this is just a picture to show. This is normal, this is accreta, this is increta, and this is perquita. Coming to pushing the serosa in the myometrium and on the endometrium. Now I'm, I'm moving to first placenta previa. Then if we have time, then we will shift to Pass de details in pass. That's fine, Dr. Kamna, I think. Yes, ma'am, sure. Yeah. So.
So what is Vasa Previa? Over to you, Dr. Kamla, you can take this. Hey, I wanted to ask the girls. Batao. Uh, batao, when when the, the, uh, the uh, vessels, the uh, vessel is below the presenting part overlying the internal loss, uh, like, like in the membranes. Uh, so, what is the fear in Vasa Previa? Uh, Tell us. Mom, sudden fetal distress can happen because it's a fetal blood. Uh, exactly. Yeah. So, how do you suspect or how do you anticipate? Uh, Ma'am, diagnose. Yes. Ma'am, studying uh, the rupture of a membrane and the decreasing fetal heart rate uh, mm. can we can, uh, can give a clue as well. Any any high risk factors when you you should you know it is always better to be cautious. So where where do you anticipate a high index of suspicion is required for this? Uh, whenever you are doing an ultrasound, you should always look for placental abnormalities also. Um, if, see, uh, if you are able to see, okay. Yeah. So there are of two types, Doctor Kamna. Hanji. So any velamentous cord incision, yeah, fir. There is a success issue. So whenever you see elementus cord insertion, there is an area of, uh, uh, there is a membrane part which does not have the placenta, but the cord has already inserted. So the vessels are running through the membrane. And this again happens in the succensurate lobe also. So whenever there is a part of membrane which is carrying the blood vessels, and if they rupture uh, incidentally or accidentally, so then this leads to bleeding of the, this. now this is the fetal blood. So this blood is lost and is generally associated with fetal mortality. It is very less, very rare to save a fetus. So you should always have a high index of suspicion. And whenever there is, you see the fetal heart rate going dropping uh, significantly with uh, bleeding PV, should always immediately take the patient for cesarean section is the only answer uh, for previa. Okay. So the incidence is rare, one in 5,000, but yeah. Um, with IVF, uh, the, there is an again a high risk factor. Yes, so all yes. patients who are conceived after in vitro fertilization, you have to have, you should be careful regarding all abnormal placentations, including yeah, vasopathy. because sixty percent have a history of low lying placenta in second or second trimester placenta previa also. And placenta equita syndrome is also common in these yeah. patients, so we have to be very careful here. So basically, complication is fetal death because of fetal hemorrhage. So here, how do you plan pregnancy? Suppose you have seen Vasa Previa in ultrasound and um, we how will you manage? Uh, Ma'am, we are going to give a corticosteroid to the, uh, for the baby uh, for yeah. the fetal term maturity at uh, uh, 32 weeks of the pregnancy. And we are going to plan uh, the termination of pregnancy by a cesarean section at 34 to 36 yes. weeks. Yeah. So you the one important precaution is delivered before rupture of membranes. Yes, yes. Okay, and uh, antenatal corticosteroid yes. definitely preterm hospitalization at 30 to 34 weeks, then delivery at 30 to 37 weeks, and it occurs at a center which is capable to provide immediate neonatal transfusion. And these two things I have found in many literature, but I am not discussing them because we are not doing any of these tests in our hospitals. Okay, but. For other examiners, you can read this. Basically, with aptus, we know the fetal blood, and with pleur is the amount of sensitization, RS sensitization. So, not going to thank you. I'm going back to my <laughs> placenta <laughs> acrita, <laughs> which has not yet been discussed. This is also called morbidly adherent placenta, and in Europe, you know, it is called pernicious placenta previa. So, you should also be acquainted with this term. So, this is the picture, and. Uh, Theory is this, that there is an imperfect development of the fibrinoid and nicapoops layers, and there is constitutional endometrial defect. You see, like, just scar pregnancy, uh, earlier in earlier months of pregnancy, the scar pregnancy, basically it is an incipient stage of placenta per crete or in crete only, because the decidua is irregular there and the nicapoop layer is absent, so that's why the placenta implants on the scar. So they need to be treated there only, otherwise they will become placenta per crete or in crete. 
So what are the risk factors for PAS? Uh, Smita, please. You tell me the common causes first. I want to hear the common cause first. Previous history of uh, placenta accreta and previous LSCS. Yes. And with the number of previous LSCS, the incidence increases, right? Yes, ma'am. Increasing number of LSCS. Yes, yes. Uh, and if there is any previous uterine surgery or yes. any cervical ablation, uterine curettage is being done. In the yes, region. multiple DNCs. Yeah, yeah. Uh, these all factors increases the risk of present accretor syndrome. Yeah, so this is as per FIGO guideline. There is a beautiful FIGO guideline, 2021, I think, on percent accreta spectrum. So it has divided it beautifully, direct surgical scar, cesarean delivery, surgical termination of pregnancy, DNC, myomectomy also, mm -hmm. and endometrial section and Asamban syndrome. Non-surgical IVF procedures, which are INRG embolization, endometritis, because it makes the surface rough. Mm -hmm. That's why then intrauterine device, manual livable of placenta. That's why it is very important to take a history of MRP. And uh, then you try an anomalies, bicoordinate uterus and submucous fibroid, because submucous fibroid makes it irregular. Implantation site, whenever uh, if there is an irregular implantation site, because of any reason, any injury or anything, then placenta acquita may happen. Morbidly adherent placenta acquita may occur. So, and it is a major risk factor, as we have already told in a case of previous cesarean, especially with anterior low line placenta. Uh, this is a very important message by RCOG guideline that women requesting elective cesarean delivery for non-medical indications should be informed of the risk of placenta accreta spectrum and its consequences for subsequent pregnancy. There are many women who want cesarean delivery without any reason. That means primary cesarean section without any reason. Tell her, inform her that this may increase the risk of PAS because the number of cesarean sections increases the risk of PAS. So we have to focus on the prevention of primary cesarean section. And this is the this is a beautiful diagram which I wanted to share with you. The incidence is increasing with the number of cesarean sections. You know, it is very difficult to remember this. So I found out this diagram from somewhere and I liked it very much. One with one cesarean, this with two cesarean, 11%, with 340, with 461, and with 567. That's why nowadays we are because the Incidence of cesarean has been increased from 20 to 35 percent, and in private around 50 percent. So the incidence of placenta accreta spectrum is increasing, and we'll be getting more and more cases. So you, we have already discussed how it is diagnosed antenatally. I just wanted to share this slide with you. Those who are much interested, they can take a screenshot of this. This is an index which can diagnose placenta accreta spectrum. We have already discussed the USD findings in earlier slides. But this is another complimentary slide. Dr. Josna Suri was kind enough to share this slide with me. She had done a lot of work on placenta equita. And MRI is not a substitute, but it complements ultrasound imaging because it helps in the depth of invasion and lateral extension of myometrial invasion, especially with posterior presentation and in women with ultrasound mm -hmm. signs suggestive of parametrial mm -hmm. invasion. So, what is the fear with PES? Uh, Pile this time, you will tell us. Uh, Ma'am, uh, uh, the patient... I think the most important thing is to get the most important thing. Okay, right? What do you think? The severe postpartum hemorrhage can happen and we, uh, we have to do, in that case, a peripartum hysterectomy. Uh, and uh, yeah. uh, there are uh, risk factors of uh, having the urinary tract uh, injuries or a bowel injury or bladder injury also. There are yes, yes. more chances of a patient can admit in an ICU care. And, yeah. uh, a patient may require many, many blood transfusions, right? So, you just are saying that severe hemorrhage happens because you should know that the blood flow through the uterine artery at term is around 600 to 600 to 800 ml per minute. Yes, this means if the bleeding is not controlled, which is happening from the uterine artery, then this patient may exsanguinate in seven to eight minutes because a female has usually five liters of blood, approximately, right? Placenta accreta spectrum, how and where should you uh, make these women deliver? It should be delivered in the hospital that is well equipped with ICU facility, blood transfusion facility. Uh, so, uh, chronic, chronic pelvic surgeries can be done well 
you have to have a multidisciplinary approach mm -hmm. not just your blood bank icu your anesthetist your urologist your surgeon your ctvs people your senior obstetricians so everybody a senior neonatologist everybody should be will need to get involved in such a case okay along with this you have to take a good consent from the patient regarding the morbidity and mortality in such cases they are at a high risk and uh, if these cases are pre diagnosed and always try to keep these patients in morning hours then like all it. the facilities and all senior people are available that is very important oh. So delivery should be scheduled for the peak availability of all resources and team members. And whenever it can be accidentally opened in a peripheral center, I've told you, close the abdomen, send the patient to a higher center. Delivery timing, placenta percrita diagnosed earlier in the antenatal period. So when, how will you time the delivery? Um, uh, we, uh, we will terminate the pregnancy at 34 to 36 weeks. Yeah, you cannot afford emergency cases. Yes. You have to do it electively. So this is the guideline, what the guideline says. SUG says between 34 to 35 and RCUG 35 to 36. Okay. Or earlier SOS. Surgical approach, I have already said you. Now you can tell Dr. Kamna what is the surgical approach. And this is for you as a postgraduate student. What will be your answer? Payal? Ma'am, we are going to give the... Um, Inframbilical in vertical rea, uh, incision on the abdomen. And you might not be able to go to the upper segment giving an inframbilical incision. Okay. Abdominal exactly. incision. <laughs> 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 Transverse. Transverse. Either oh, inframbilical mat bola. Vertical incision you have to give, but yes. that incision will have to go above the umbilicus because yes. upper segment is not approachable. Exactly, exactly. But the thing you can do, you can open it to, from the infirm, like have a look at the uh, lower uterine segment and then uh, extend your incision. And you have to put, you have to give incision as a classical. Uh, you have to look at the placenta percrita, go little one to two fingers above the upper boundary of the placenta percrita. You have to make incision there only. I have a short video, one and a half minutes. Some other day I will show you. And then you will not make any attempt to separate the placenta. People do attempt. Yeah. Please do not make any attempt. Eh? Just do cesarean hysterectomy in C2. So these are the precautions which we take. We make a white bladder flap, classical hysterectomy, no attempt of manual removal of placenta. And definitely internal allegatory ligation followed by cesarean hysterectomy. This has been discussed, I think. That, yeah. Yeah, this has been discussed. Uh, so, there is a question in the chat box, Dr. Shetty. Yeah, that I will answer. Yeah, I know. I, I thought that I will answer it live. How to proceed if we encounter anterior placenta previa with transverse lie intraoperatively? See, I, we have already told you that if it is an anterior placenta previa, you see whether it is placenta percrita or increta. And if it is there, then please, if you are in a tertiary facility, call your senior persons and make an alarm for everything, all multidisciplinary team along with blood transfusion. And uh, if it is not a placenta, not a placenta percrita or increta, not a pass, then you can you can either go rupture the membrane, go through uh, rupture the membrane, take the uh, fetal leg, get hold of the fetal leg, and try to deliver the baby. Or suppose accidentally have cut through the placenta, cut through the placenta, then as I have said, expedite the delivery. The only thing, only fear is placenta percrita. Mm -hmm. That I've already told you. You want to add something, Doctor Kamna? May I still, if you, if you have the facility of ultrasound, please put a probe before wheeling in the patient. That will really help you in the OT because you can find the window where the where the placental thickness is minimum. So that will decrease yeah. the blood loss to yeah. a far good extent. Yes. And then yes. you know where is the back, where are the limbs, especially in a case of transverse line, you should do an ultrasound. And in, in case of emergency, we don't have a choice, but if you have the facility of ultrasound, do an ultrasound, see the lie of the position, uh, position of the fetus, the lie of the fetus. Uh, the position of the limbs and back and the window where you have to give your uterine incision, the area which has the least placental thickness. That that helps. Yeah, if the USG facility is available, that helps. But in most that of the mean. centers, USG facility is not available. So this is how you do it. Uh -huh. And uh, sometimes case. it may so happen that you have to give a little upper incision or uh, you have to give a J incision. Uh, accordingly, that you can do. On behalf of AOGD and the Delhi PG Forum, 
I would like to congratulate the moderators and the PG students for an excellent presentation. It was really, really very nice. And the entire topic of APH was covered beautifully with all the relevant information required for postgraduates and in a very lucid manner. That was very important. So I thank Dr. Shashi and Dr. Kamna who have really toiled hard with the postgraduates. The postgraduates have also done extremely well. So I hope all our attendees must have benefited from today's class. And last but not the least, I am really thankful to Jackson Pal, our academic partner, for giving us this wonderful platform. So our next episode is on 20th March, which is infertility. So we will hope to meet again in March. So thank you so much. Thank you so thank much. You so much. Thank Sunita you. Madam, thank Sunita you. Madam, Sunita Ma'am. Thank, yes. thank you. Ma thank you, Rishi and Kamna, you did well. Thank yep. you, Ma'am. Thank, thank, thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, on behalf of Jackson Pal, I thank the experts and all the attendees who were present here today. Presenting to you Divatron, our micronized Didrogestron 10 mg tablets. This Divatron has been awarded last year uh, at the AVEX Marketing Excellence Award. And the first round of is Divatron from Jackson. And the second round of is Lycorate, the ultimate cell protector. And we have maintained injection of hydroxyprogesterone caproid, the only US FDA approved progestin for preterm delivery. So as ma'am just now said, the next episode is on 20th of March. Do join in. Thank you all very much. Bye-bye. Thank you. 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 Thank you.